Hi all, welcome back to the channel. I am continuing on in my backpacking gear series and uh, the last two videos were about backpacking tents, um, specifically the comparing the two that I use or have used, um, Big Agnes Fly Creek UL2 and the Big Agnes Tiger Wall UL2. And I am currently sitting in the Tiger Wall UL2 and um, gonna talk to you today about sleeping pads. So there are two major functions or purposes for a sleeping pad when you're backpacking and one is for comfort and another one would be for insulation from the cold. When you backpack in the mountains, even in the summer, overnight temperatures can drop considerably and so that um, sleeping pad can lift you up off the cold ground and provide a layer of insulation between you and the cold ground. So there are multiple types of sleeping pads. There are air pads, which is what I use, and these are manually inflated by either uh, exhaling into the pad and airing it up that way, or using a uh, little battery operated mini pump, which most air pad makers make these days that, to fit their specific valves. They are lightweight and usually pretty comfortable, although I'll come back to the comfort aspect a little bit later and talk about that. They tend to be more expensive than other pads, especially the lighter weight and the more insulation. A couple of cons aside from the fact that they can get pretty expensive, one is that they can be really noisy. Every time you move, you know, it sounds like you're laying on a bunch of potato chip bags or something. Some of these pads are noisy enough that uh, it could be a wildlife deterrent. So if you wanted to look at it as a positive in that way, I certainly do when I backpack alone. They also can be punctured pretty easily. So the reason I'm using the pad that I am now is because the previous brand, while it was very good and the brand had excellent customer service, I cannot say enough good things about the customer service. The pad, I had two and each one was popped. And granted, I think both times it was my dogs that popped it. Even so, the pad that I use now, my dogs have been on it and they haven't popped it yet. So anyway, just be aware that they can be, some of them can be punctured very easily. You can patch them if it's not a major puncture. Uh, you can patch them and get them functioning again. Um, my issue with one of them when it punctured was that it punctured on a seam, on a baffle seam, and it was really difficult to repair it because of the location of the tear of the puncture. So that one I couldn't actually repair, and um, I contacted the manufacturer, and they actually sent me another one for free, and they also put a pillow in, in the package when they sent me the replacement. So absolutely wonderful customer service but the second pad that they sent me ended up also puncturing and so I didn't go back to them after that. I, I went with a different brand. Um, that brand was actually Exped. So Exped, I highly recommend due to their customer service. They are super. Um, I still have the pillow and I use it, but I've since gone to Thermarest and so far I've used the Thermarest for I think three years three or four years and um, the dogs have yet to puncture it and it's it's noisy but it's it's pretty durable and I like it and it's warm. The last thing I want to mention about manually inflatable air pads is that if you do use your breath to inflate them, the moisture from your breath can also eventually cause mold inside the pad. So the second category of sleeping pads um, would be self-inflating pads. Thermarest, I think, was the first company to create a self-inflating pad like way back in the 70s. Basically, there's a valve in it and there's, there is open cell foam inside the pad, but it also utilizes air to inflate, to self-inflate. So you would open the valve and just unroll it and it, over time it would inflate itself. So opening the valve basically allows the foam to expand um, and brings in air in the process. The last category I'm just going to mention are the closed cell foam pads. Um, these are made from a dense foam filled with tiny closed air cells. 
Um, they're very lightweight, they're very durable. It doesn't put you very high off the ground. Usually they're only about a half an inch thick. Um, some of them do have heat reflective surfaces on at least one side. Um, so I think Thermarest makes one that's called the Z Sol or something, S O L, um, that reflects your body heat back to you when you lay on it. They don't roll down very compactly. They're pretty bulky, and usually, if you purchase and use one of these types of pads, you're probably going to be um, carrying it on the outside of your pack. So those are the three major types of sleeping pads that you can purchase. And um, you can also just get a, a foam pad. Again, bulky, um, it doesn't pack down as well. You would probably roll it and attach it to the outside of your pack somewhere. Um, also not as great for insulating properties. I'm gonna go ahead and show you my um, current sleeping pad and uh, give you some features that I like and some things that I don't like. So since um, I was diagnosed as asthmatic and I've had some issues with um, breathing, especially at high altitudes, I switched from um, inflating my sleeping pad myself to using the little battery operated mini pumps. It does operate off of two AAA batteries. Um, so not a huge deal and they last forever. I mean, I've had the same batteries in this for probably two seasons at least. And then this is what my sleeping pad looks like when it's rolled up. I'm just gonna unroll it and uh, inflate it and I'll show you what it looks like and talk about some of the features that I like and don't like. So basically, the R-Value system is a system that companies pretty standardly use now. In fact, I think just last year um, they created a standard system for testing and labeling um, what the R-Value of a sleeping pad is so that across the board, no matter what company makes the pad, the R value basically equates to the same level of warmth. Um, so the higher the R number, the warmer it is, the more insulated it is. The lower the R value, the less warmth you're gonna feel from it. If you have an R value of five, then it's pretty well insulated. An R value of two is not gonna give you that much insulation. Um, as I age, I've actually discovered that these air pads are becoming less and less comfortable. And I find myself having to let air out uh, at some point in the middle of the night to make it more comfortable. And to be honest with you, I, I'm constantly playing with this and I've never really found the exact balance when I was younger. It never bothered me. As I'm aging and, and trying to continue backpacking, I'm just, I'm finding that I'm having to adjust to certain things that I never would have given a second thought um, when I was younger. But anyway, so you would either blow this up with your breath or purchase one of these mini pumps that is designed specifically for your pad to fit on that specific nozzle. So this is Thermarest's mini pump. And you can see, as soon as you flip the lid, it turns on. Initially, I was kind of taken aback by the noise. And it's, you know, that noise is the last thing that I want when I'm out in the backcountry. It's become a necessity for me um, since I've become asthmatic. So I do use this and I just put up with the, the noise. It's actually not that loud, but when you're in the backcountry, it really feels loud. It feels louder than it is. But you uh, push down on this little front area and pop up the lid. And then there's a little tube that pulls out. And you open the valve as, as open as you can get it. And then put that little tube over the valve, completely over the valve. Hard to do one-handed. It does take a little bit of time. So generally, when I get to camp and I put up my tent, this is one of the first things I'll do. Um, I'll come in and I'll start airing this pad up and then maybe I'll go outside and, and fix dinner while this is airing up. So it doesn't take that long in the grand scheme of things. You can already see um, that there is some air inside already. 
but it has to fill this entire length. So it's been about three minutes and depending on how much air you want in your sleeping pad, um, you might let this go a little bit longer, but I am at the point where I would probably stop it because as I said before, the, the more air that's in the pad, the more it, it actually kind of hurts my back. So I've gotten to where I kind of have a general idea where to stop airing it up. And then typically throughout the night, I end up letting out even more air to get comfortable. So, so we'll just stop it right there and then close this turn it to tighten it and tuck this thing back inside and close the lid and that's that. I think this is a is a worthwhile piece of gear if you can get past the noise. As I said, it's not really that noisy. It just feels like it when you're out in the back country and everything is so still and, and peaceful and quiet. You don't usually want to um, interfere with that. But um, for a few minutes to make airing up your sleeping pad quick and easy. This is a worthwhile piece of gear in my opinion. So here's the sleeping pad aired up. And <clears throat> if you look at the baffles, they're not as pronounced as some sleeping pads. And I actually like that because um, it's a little bit more comfortable. The sleeping pad I had before this, the X-Ped, the baffles were so distinct that I often would kind of feel my body rolling between them. Um, as I recall, the pad that I had also had vertical baffles instead of horizontal ones. And so I constantly felt like I was rolling between the baffles, which I didn't particularly care much for. So I, I prefer the horizontal and less pronounced baffles. But I'm gonna turn off my mic so that you can hear how noisy this is. Okay, it says the mic is disconnected, so let's try this. But do you hear that foil in there? So that's, that foil is typically used as a heat reflective material. But unfortunately, it's noisy. And so if you can imagine all your weight shifting under this all night long, if you have friends that are backpacking with you, they're going to hear that. So that is a potential um, con, a, a potential disadvantage to these, but I also feel like the advantages far outweigh the dis that noise disadvantage. So, um, you know, again, when I'm backpacking by myself, I actually kind of like that because I feel like it can be a wildlife deterrent if there's anything out messing around near your tent and you turn and you make this loud noise, um, they're probably going to run off. But you can see this sleeping pad pretty much takes up one side of my Tiger Wall UL2 and um, it is a tapered sleeping pad so it's wider at the top than it is at the bottom and again I'll try to find the specs. But it's designed to kind of fit with the mummy sleeping bags which I don't use anymore but um, it's the same general concept and it also allows you to cut weight. You know, when you design sleeping bags and sleeping pads in this way where it tapers at the foot, it allows a lot of weight to be cut. Um, but you can get sleeping pads that are shaped differently, um, that are different sizes. You can get extra wides, extra long if you're tall. Um, you can get double sleeping mats if you go backpacking with a significant other or, uh, or just a partner that you feel comfortable sharing. Instead of taking two separate sleeping pads, you can actually buy one single sleeping pad that is a double. Um, so there are definitely options, but this is my, my current air pad of choice. And I'll just get on it and you can listen to how noisy it is. Ah. So, my feet are pretty much at the very end, at the very bottom of the pad. I'm 5'4". Um, the width is actually, this is not a wide. And um, I wish it was because 
What I have found is that my arms end up resting on the ground here on the side and getting cold. Um, so if I were in the market for a new sleeping pad, I would probably look for a wide. So another thing about um, sleeping pads is some of the newer sleeping bags now come with a pad pocket because if you don't have a way to keep the pad still all night, it can move around, which is somewhat annoying. And especially if you lay your sleeping bag on top of it, that sleeping bag material is really slick. And I mean, you just slide all over the place on these pads. So um, I have switched to a, a down quilt, so I don't use a, a bag anymore, but newer bags come with a sleeping pad, pad pocket that the pad goes into. The quilt that I have and most quilts come with elastic straps that fasten it to your sleeping pad. So typically what I'll do to deflate my sleeping pad is first thing in the morning, before I have gotten off of the pad, I'll just reach up here and open it and uh, let the air escape while I'm still laying on it. Because I don't know about any of you, but sometimes I'm a little slow to wake in the early, early morning hours. And so I'll just lay on this until I can feel the ground under me. And then I'll get up and start folding it. All right, so most of the air is out. There's still some inside here, but it's enough to, enough to get started folding it back up. So this is how I generally fold it back up. I will fold it vertically in half. And then I'll start at the foot end and roll it and squeeze the air out as I roll it. And that's that. You can, if you want, um, put a rubber band around this to keep it rolled tight. I don't ever do that. I just take my stuff sack and put it in there because when I am actually on the trail, I have lots of other things in this bag. I have my night clothes and extra underwear and socks and things like that. So there's plenty of other gear in this bag generally to shove around it to keep it rolled. And that's that. I just wanted to add one quick thing to the end of this video about sleeping pads. And that is a recommendation for resources and more information about anything, backpacking, through hiking, section hiking, any of that. And that is this website called sectionhiker.com, hiking and backpacking for beginners and experts. I have used this website often over the years. It is very useful. You can subscribe to their newsletter and get new blog posts sent directly to your inbox. But this is so informative, and I wanted to just mention it. I have no connection to sectionhiker.com at all. I just use it and think that it's a fantastic resource, so I want to pass it along. There are tons of gear reviews and gear guides on this website, and also articles about, um, well, you can see up here, ultralight backpacking, winter hiking, gear guides, gear reviews, gear lists. So there's a lot on this website, but I just wanted to show you, for example, if you come up here to the search bar and you type sleeping pad. So you're gonna get a bunch of results and some of these are bags, that's okay, it's picking up the word sleeping in our search. So I wonder if we could, you know, let's do this the old fashioned way and see if it actually works. Nope, uh, let's see, how about that? Yeah, so that seemed to do the trick. So you can see as you come down through here, there are um, several sleeping pad reviews. If you're starting from scratch and you don't really know what companies are making sleeping pads and you don't really know anything about them, where to start looking, what brands are the most common, the most highly rated, this is a good place to start. So if you go to sectionhiker.com, and I'll put this link down in the video description, but here's an article about the new standardized sleeping pad R values. 
This is basically the manual that all companies use to create a standardized R value across the board. Basically means that any pad, any company, you can look at that R value and trust that it's a similar insulation rating compared to another pad by another company. So I just wanted to show you this part sleeping pad R values and their air temperatures. This is basically going to give you an idea of what R value you're looking for in your sleeping pad. And your sleeping bag plays into this as well. I think there's a chart somewhere also that shows how your sleeping bag rating combines with the pad rating. But just to give you an example, so if the air temperature is 50 Fahrenheit, then your R value of one is probably gonna be fine. If your temperature is 22, 15 in this range, your minimum R value that you're going to want to look for in that case is a 3 to a 4. And because I know that I run cold, I would move that even farther over here. So according to the new R value scale, the pad that I have that I currently use, which is the Thermarest Neo Air X Therm, has an R value of 6.9. It does weigh 15 ounces. And uh, that 6.9 is not even on this chart. So, I mean, it's, it's plenty warm. So just keep in mind, you've got to know if you run cold or if you run warm. And uh, it just kind of start somewhere and see how it works for you and go from there. But anyway, this website, sectionhiker.com, I'll put the link in the description. It's just a tremendous resource for backpacking, through hiking, and um, all things related. So definitely check it out. I think it will help a lot. Just spend some time scrolling around in here. Use the search bar and um, search for the things that you're wanting to learn about. This is an excellent resource, so I hope it helps you, and I will catch you on the next video.